Okay, what if I was to shove some gum into my mouth? Would you think that I was doing it to gain some performance? Well, what if I told you that a simple piece of gum could be the key to unlocking your cycling performance? Today, I'm gonna reveal a surprising connection between chewing gum and performance gains after spotting a rider chewing gum in their warm up for the cross country mountain bike race at the World Championships. Hello, I'm Damien Roos and welcome to Quick Spin. If you are new here, our Quick Spin compiles all of the cycling related information and things from the internet in an easy to digest format with all the best news and views. Today, gum wasn't the only interesting thing that I spotted at the World Championships. I go over my top five intriguing finds. Some good articles out this week, one on the evolution of endurance training and how much does it cost to get into road cycling now versus 10 years ago. Finally, in the social media rounds, people love a good pylon, so we have some strong reactions to a few debated issues and incidents. And like I always say, I watch, read, and listen to all of the news, so you don't have to, but you can find the links for everything on the show in the show notes. Let's start with my take on the World Championships. Here are five of the most interesting things that I spotted across the coverage of only the road track and mountain bikes in the inaugural cycling Olympics. Starting with that performance enhancing gum. It was Puck Peters warming up with the gum in preparation for the cross country Olympic race. And while I may have this all wrong, it could just be some grape flavored hubba bubba. It might also be something like this, the run gum or run gum in bubble gum flavor, of course. The gum's key ingredient is caffeine and the effects of caffeine on performance are well known, as is the timing, which is one hour before it's needed is when you take it. Now, some quick math lets us see if it's possible to have enough gum to make a difference in a race. And as you need a lot of it, and coffee, a coffee or two just won't do it. So it's usually tablets. But this specific gum has 50 milligrams of caffeine per caffeine per piece. And while you're looking at three to six milligrams per kilogram, we can estimate puck at around 55 kilograms. So the range is 165 to 330 milligrams. So four to six pieces of gum, and that is not impossible. And one more note on gum, chewing gum can decrease anxiety and tension and it has been shown to reduce anxiety and stress. So if you're anxious or nervous before a race or a ride, chewing gum may actually help you during your warm up, and it may dismantle some of the nerves and the mental chatter. The next one up here is Josh Tarling. What an epic ride to come third in the time trial. And I thought we all have this thought from time to time, But interestingly, especially as a young rider, he didn't ride with a power meter. And the only thing I can say is poor coach. But even thinking about that poor coach, this is good for the sport. We do need some riders that ride on feel as much as the riders that ride on power. The third one, Michael Matthews' epic super stem. Matthews' nutrition notes on his super long stem. The stem notes show that Matthews was planning on getting through a 500 milliliter bottle per hour with a combination of carbs, big carbo, and salts. There's also plenty of variety in the food. Carb, gels, isotonic gels, bakes, chews, rice cakes, and a CIS nootropics gel, which contains cognizant cycholine. When I hear about this and nootropics, I immediately think of something like modafinil, which is a banned substance. But when I looked up this substance and it's not on the list, so more power to the writers that are using this, although I haven't looked into the claims made by SIS about enhanced cognitive performance. Next up here are new track bikes released ahead of the 2024 Olympic Games. And the worlds were the last chance to get your gear used and inspected by the UCI before the Paris Olympics. So we did see the odd team rider on new bikes, but even at this early stage of unveiling new bikes, it is not without controversy. France unveiled the Look P24, Japan the V Izu TCM track bike, Canyon Speedmax CFR track was there, and the 2023 Hope Lotus bike, also spotted were some of Romelo Stacano's tread bike creations, and I'm not sure these are bound for Paris, but with his one cyclist, one bike philosophy, 
we are seeing some interesting takes on positioning. But as mentioned, the controversy has already started with a report by Cycling News that British Cycling could take legal action to prevent Japanese and French federations from using their new track bikes. The concerns relate to potential patent infringements regarding wide fork and seat stays, and the design concept aligns these elements with the rider's legs for improved airflow. The patent for this design was granted in April 2022, and as this was the last chance to get your bikes out before Paris, this legal action could result in bikes not being allowed for competition. Next up, we have some fun behind the scenes of Dutch paracyclist Daniel Abraham Gabru's training before winning his first world title on the track in the men's C5 scratch race. Gebru went out in the morning and did a 167 kilometer ride with 1800 meters of climbing in South Lanklarkshire, <laughs> setting a new KOM on Strava. Then at 7.30 p.m. that night, he raced the scratch race and won. To be fair though, this doesn't really seem like a regular thing for him. And he was more focused on not missing a training day than anything else. And interestingly, he acknowledged that his coach might not have approved the six hour ride. And this sounds a little bit like a Chris Froome and Richie Port thing to do. And my bonus one here is Alan Hathaly's aero shoe covers in XCO. Not sure if they're needed, but why not? Next up, the articles. And the first one is the rising price of entry-level road bikes. How much does it cost to get into road cycling now versus 10 years ago by Emily Tillett on road.cc? This piece was asking the question, are entry-level road bikes in danger of becoming luxury items? And breaking down the cost of bikes, equipment and clothing for those getting into the sport in 2023 versus the previous decade. Starting with price, premium road bike prices have been increasing, influencing people's expectations for higher costs. And this trend isn't limited to top tier models, but extends to entry level bikes as well. I'm only going to go over a couple here, but we start with something like the Specialized Alley. And the Specialized Alley is a staple in their lineup. And it has experienced a significant price increase with the entry level model now costing around 80% more than a decade ago. Or if we talk about Giant, we talk about Giant Contend, Giant's entry level road bike. The Contend has seen its price rise by about 40% since its launch in 2016, remaining relatively affordable compared to some other models. But isn't that just Giant in a nutshell? Finally, Trek. Trek's base model is the Trek 1.1, and it's evolved into the Trek Domain Owl 2 with a price increase of around 55%. And so despite this, it retains features suitable for an entry-level road bike. So to sum up the price stuff, the article concludes that entering road cycling now requires a larger budget with entry-level bikes experiencing a 30 to 50% price increase. However, options like the second-hand market and the cycle to work scheme can make cycling more affordable. All right, now this one is for the training nerds and on Outside Online, there's an article by Sweat Science, master communicator, Alex Hutchinson, and it's on the evolution of world-class endurance training, which was a paper released that examines the trajectory of endurance training, highlighting both current trends and future possibilities. The study offers a glimpse into the future of endurance training, predicting the continuation and amplification of current trends. Artificial intelligence is expected to personalize training regimes while refining the altitude, heat, training, athlete equipment, interactions, and injury prevention will drive progress into the future. However, the delicate interplay between technology and individual readiness remains a challenge. Ultimately, the future promises faster athletes, but it is the intricate balance of science, technology, and athlete well-being that will shape their journey. Moving on to interesting products that have been released recently, the only thing that actually caught my eye for today's show was the Altitude Adjustment app on the Garmin Connect store. The developer, Luke Greft, explains that it displays sea level power as a data field, but takes into account the current elevation and power and adjusts accordingly. It supports the main studies used as references for changes in threshold at different elevations, including Simmons formula based on Clark et al, Bassett et al, both acclimatized and non-acclimatized formulas, and Peronet. 
et al. And finally, power is presented as instant power, three second average, or a 10 second average. A useful addition to any athlete who is riding at altitude. So now we get to the social media rounds, and there are two takes this week that got slaughtered. Well, there's actually three, two and a half. The first one, a bit of controversy this week with ex-pro and convicted doper David Miller taking delivery of a car or truck, four-wheel drive, a big thing. And note, I only realised a month or so ago that the Grenadier was even a thing, like an actual car, and it really shows how much attention I do not pay to team sponsors. But anyway... The comments are not so nice, and it seems everyone had something bad to say about this beast. With comments like this, and this, being more common than not. But honestly, all of the commenters probably just wanted an excuse to have a go at Miller as it seems like more of a reflection of how they felt about David Miller before this car came along than anything else. What do you think? What do you think to the car? Yay or nay? Okay, the second bit of controversy here. Let me explain the situation before we get into the reactions. Swiss pro Marlene Rousseur stopped her race in the individual time trial sometime before the 23.1 kilometer timing check in the 36.2 kilometer race where she sat on the side of the road. And she was quoting, like, quoted later as saying, I had to give up. It wasn't a mechanical problem, it was just me. Going on to say, since the tour, I feel I need time to breathe and rediscover my desire to go out and win. I feel like I'm caught up in a never ending downward spiral. On this individual time trial, as soon as I tried to put it right, I felt that it wasn't possible. I couldn't accelerate, so I decided to stop. I wasn't ready to race that time trial. I had no desire to do it. I need a break. I'm not a machine. As you can imagine, there are a lot of different reactions on social media to something like this. Everything from mockery to empathy to this take by the cycling mole saying, selected to represent her country in today's ITT, she gave up and quit despite being fourth at the first time check, citing mental exhaustion. Compare that attitude to those who had to use road bikes. No chance of winning, who continued to ride on. Which ended up getting him in a bit of heat for his lack of empathy, to which I think the best take was this one. And to the mole's credit, he didn't disagree on what was being said. But these types of incidents and reactions always lead us to the topic of mental health in elite athletes. The way media talks about mental health plays a part in how people feel when things like this happen to athletes. And these different opinions on Sally happened because of how the media talks about sports and how the idea that athletes are supposed to be perfect and special but we can all play a part in changing this. And I think people were quicker than ever to call out bad takes, and hopefully this gives athletes the space to be human. The final one here is the UCI's decision to change the rules around the start order for the men's cross-country Olympic race. Nino Scherter jumped in with a long post on it, and even Tom Pidcock was against it. There was a bit of a backlash against Scherter, surprisingly, after a it was posted, but of course, only love for Pidcock. Most agree that the rules themselves aren't the issue, it's the timing, so definitely over to you, UCI. We are yet to see a response. And that's our quick spin around the world of cycling. Ride well and catch you next time.